Good morning. It's good to see all of you here this morning. My name is uh, Brian Silver. I am not on the pastoral staff here at Hope, uh, nor am I an elder here at Hope. My current title uh, here at Hope is the resident church planter or church planter in residency, something along those lines. I don't really know, but it's, uh, it's fun. I enjoy doing what I'm doing. It's trying to figure out how to do this church uh, here someplace else. And so I wanted to thank the elders and the pastors for giving me the opportunity to come before you this morning and open the word. And uh, so that's, uh, that's, this is, uh, maybe, here we go. This is my wife and me. Uh, we came to Hope two years ago, and I entered into the Leadership Development Institute. If you're familiar with that at all, if you've heard about that, um, I was functioning as a youth pastor up in Shoreview, and God laid it on my heart to plant churches. And so he put it on my heart to come to Hope because Hope knows what they're doing when it comes to planting churches, and so that's why uh, I'm here. So if you're visiting here this morning, just know that this is not normally who you'd see on a given Sunday, and just want to say thank you for coming and checking us out uh, for sure as we dig into God's Word. We're going to be in Luke, uh, which is ironic because two years ago when I came to Hope, we were going through Luke. We had just started. Um, <laughs> Little did I know I'd be up here preaching and let alone actually preaching through the same gospel of Luke. So um, we're excited for the opportunity. And so we're just going to uh, dig in. If you have more questions about me and my family, uh, feel free to talk to me afterwards. But uh, I just want to get into the text. Um, so I do have a quick question, though, for you. And I'll give you a hint here if you can't get it. But does anyone know who this is? Go ahead and shout it out. Give, give me a guess. St. Patrick. What'd you say? St. Patrick. Th no, that's incorrect. Um, it's not St. Patrick. Um, I, I will give you a hint, and this is the hint. This is probably one of the most overused analogies ever in the history of church, well, at least since the 90s, if that makes sense. Sir William Wallace. Ah, looks almost like, almost got it, but not quite. Um, I, I, I say this because the passage we're going to look at, ironically, there's actually some, some carryover, and there's some there's some connection to the story of William Wallace, which, spoiler alert, Hollywood embellishes the story. I don't, I don't I, I, it was weird as I was doing some research with this. Um, I'm going to talk about William Wallace in a, in a minute, but I feel as if I have to give a public service announcement. This has nothing to do with the passage or the illustration or anything, um, but this slide is a tattoo of Mel Gibson on somebody's thigh. Okay. <laughs> I bring this to your attention because if you're entering into a dating relationship, you may need to ask that person, do you happen to have Mel Gibson tattooed on your thigh? It, like, it's just the day and age we live in. You, you might have to ask that question. Um, so if you're, if you're on a dating website or something, just do everyone a favor. Just say, by the way, I do not have Mel Gibson tattooed on my thigh. Okay, that was, that was that. Let's move on. This is, in the story, Robert de Bruce, in, in the story, in the movie Braveheart. Now, you may be familiar with the movie, maybe not, and that's okay. If you haven't seen it by now, I'm not too worried about giving away the storyline. But in the story, Mel Gibson plays this guy, Sir William Wallace, and he's just a peasant. He's just a regular dude, but he cares about his freedom, right? And he wants to get away from the English. And so what does he do? He starts fighting and fighting and he builds this massive army of just regular people, of peasants who come and they storm the gates, but this guy and his buddies, the nobles, don't like it. Why? Because the nobles are in cahoots with the king of England, right? William Longshanks. And they don't like it because these guys get their power and their authority and their money from the king and so what do they do? They send spies. They do everything they can to kill William Wallace. So that's kind of where we're going to be going as we get into. We've been in the Gospel of Luke again, and I'll make the connection. I promise. I won't leave you hanging there. Make the connection. We've been in the Gospel of Luke again for two years, and we've been in the temple now for several weeks, almost a month or two. We've been actually in the temple in Jerusalem. And so what we've kind of been doing is kind of been like a season of 24, the TV show, um, where we've been spending every week, we've been in like one hour of real time 
um, in Jesus' life. And so that's what we're doing. So this is, so I'm basically just going to do like previously on 24, and we're going to go through where we've been, and then we'll jump into the, the text that we're going to be digging into today. So this is Luke 19, 47 through 48. He says, every day he was teaching at the temple. This is Jesus, Jesus teaching at the temple, but the chief priests and the teachers of the law and the leaders among the people, right, the nobles, were trying to kill him. Why? Yet they could not find a way to do it because the people hung on his words. That's, that's the storyline of Braveheart. Like, that's, that's it. Uh, but we're going to see all analogies break down, and we're going to see that Jesus is no William Wallace, that he's not going to fight with the sword, that he's not going to kick out the Romans with force, uh, but he's going to die for the sins of the world. Um, spoiler alert as well. Because several weeks ago, uh, Pastor Steve spoke on this passage. This is Luke 20, 1 through 2. He says, One day as Jesus was teaching the people in the temple courts and proclaiming the good news about who he is, I am, I am the Messiah, believe in me, I am the way, the truth, and the life, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, the nobles, together with the elders, came up to him, and they say, Tell us by what authority you're doing these things. They said, Who, who gave you this authority? Right, they're, they're questioning, they're accusing him. If you want to know the answer to that, log on to hopecc.com, go back a few weeks, and Steve answers this question. Um, and then likewise, another question is being presented to Jesus. This is Luke 20, 19, and we'll all read through 22. It says, the teachers of the law and the chief priests looked for a way to arrest him immediately because they knew he had spoken this parable against them. He just shares a parable. Again, I'm not going to take the time to look into that. You can go online and listen to uh, Pastor Tim spoke on this several weeks ago. But they were afraid of the people. Keeping a close watch on him, they sent spies who pretended to be sincere. And they hoped to catch Jesus in something he said so that they might hand him over to the power and authority of the governor. So the spies questioned him, Teacher, we know that you speak and teach what is right and that you do not show partiality but teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Tim answers this question, and if you say, yeah, I've heard that before, or I think I know the answer to that question, I would strongly encourage you, if you didn't hear Pastor Tim teach on this, uh, I would encourage you to go online and listen to it, because I think the answer might be different than what you may have heard in the past, so I'd like to encourage you to, to do that. Last week, you got to hear uh, one of our elders, Ben Wasik, preach on this passage, Luke 20, 27 through 33, and it says, and some of the Sadducees who say there is no resurrection, came to Jesus with a question. They give this long story about this woman who was married seven times, and they ask this question, now then at the resurrection, whose wife will she be since the seven were married to her? And then it says, and some of the teachers of the law responded, well said, teacher. And they dared not ask him any more questions. So again, previously we've just seen question, question, question. They're just trying to trip Jesus up so that the people around him say, oh, maybe he's not the Messiah. And they're looking for a way that they can trip him up so where they can kill him, so they can arrest him. Um, my cousin, Nathan, he's uh, my best friend, and he used to do this thing. He hasn't done it for a while, but he used to do this thing when you'd argue with him. that he'd, uh, He would always just say, uh, you, you know, the voices, you start talking over one another. Um, and he would just start doing this. He'd say, can I finish? Can I finish? Can I, can I finish? Can I finish? And then, and then when you'd finally say, okay, what? He'd go, okay, I'm finished. <laughs> <laughs> and it would just, but it diffused the situation. So you, you, you can try that sometime. This is what Jesus is doing. He's getting there. He's trying to teach. And it's just question, question, question. He's just asking, can I just finish? And finally they say, yes, go ahead. But he doesn't say, okay, I'm finished. Now Jesus is going to go on the offensive, right? Now, now all, all, all the stops are pulled. And he's going full bore after the teachers of the law. And we will see that um, right here. Um, just a little bit of, uh, if you are a visual learner, I am. This helps me. This is a, an artist rendition of the temple. This is not an actual picture of the second temple or Herod's temple. Um, don't worry about the words. I don't want you to read the words on there, obviously. Um, but that, if you look kind of up north, where like that golden temple is to the, to the west side there, you can see those stairs. That's where the rabbis and people would have come out to preach and to teach uh, the law. And that outside area was called the court of the Gentiles, meaning um, those of us in this room who are not actually of Jewish, Jewish ethnicity would actually be able to be in that area. That's where we would, we would be. Several weeks ago when Jesus overturns the tables, that's where he would have been. 
And if you see that like southern gate there, that enters into that middle courtyard that's called the court of the women. It doesn't mean it was restricted to women. It means that only Jewish men and Jewish women could go in there. Therefore, if we were to go back 2,000 years, I wouldn't be able to go into that area. Um, this is, I don't know who takes the time to do this, but this is a 3D rendering of the court of the women, um, which, I, which is very helpful. Uh, this is where, when we look at this story that we're going to be reading today, this is where Jesus is actually at. And we know that because it says that there was a treasury in there. And this is where, kind of like offering plates would have been, that people gave money for the temple. And so that's, that's where we are at. You could fit about 6,000 people in there. It's Passover week, so it would have been very crowded. There would have been a lot of people around Jesus in this area. So let's go ahead and read the text that we're going to be digging into today. Um, This is obviously going to be on the screen, but it's also going to be on your insert, so if you want to follow along there, uh, please do. So let's just read the text, and then we will go back, and we will uh, examine exactly what's going on here. Then Jesus said to them, why is it that the Messiah is the son of David? David himself declares in the book of Psalms, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. David calls him Lord. How then can he be his son? While all the people were listening, Jesus said to his disciples, Beware of the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes and love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and have the most important seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for a show make lengthy prayers. These men will be punished most severely. As Jesus looked up, he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. Truly, I tell you, he said, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, has put in all she has to live on. All right, here's where we're going. Uh, This is in in that insert as well. Looking at the authority of Jesus versus the authority of the teachers of the law. We're going to see this contrast of who Jesus is versus who the religious leaders are that are there. They're present with Jesus while he's teaching. And so that's what we're, that's the aim where we're going for today. And the first aspect of where Jesus gets his authority, Luke 20, 41. So again, this is the first thing that Jesus says. This is the first thing that he gets to reply and actually say what he wants to say instead of replying to questions. This is what he says. Why is it that the Messiah is the son of David? Why why would he start that way? Why would the Jewish listeners around him think that the Messiah was a descendant or a son of David? Well, it's quite simple. 2 Samuel 7, 11 through 13, this is what is commonly referred to uh, David's covenant or the Davidic covenant. King David, he was the second king of Israel, And he was extremely powerful at the time. The most powerful man in the world at that time. And through Samuel, the prophet, God gives him this promise, this covenant. He makes this promise with David. And he says, the Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you and your own flesh and blood. And I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build the house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. We also see this in the same book, in Luke. This is a passage of scripture that we read every year here at Hope. This is Luke chapter 2. He says, this is Gabriel, the angel, relaying the message to uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and, and the angel says this, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will call his name Jesus. He will be great. And he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. All right, he's saying in this passage what Jesus is saying, yes, I am a descendant of David, right? We know that from even from Luke 2, it says that when Joseph went to Bethlehem to be taxed, why? Because he was the house and lineage of David. So Jesus' earthly father, so to speak, was of that lineage. And so he is fulfilling that prophecy. He's saying, yes, I am the fulfillment of these prophecies. I am the Messiah, the son of David, a descendant, but there's much more to that. 
He's not just saying, I'm just a man. I'm just a physical man whose great, 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 great grandfather was a king. I'm more than that. So he says this. He says, David himself declares in the book of Psalms, and he quotes here Psalm 110, verse 1. There's no need to go back and look at it because it's a direct quote of Psalm 110, verse 1. And he says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. David calls him Lord. How then can he be his son? So he's asking a question. How can King David, the most powerful man in the world, call his son Lord? It's not something we do. I don't have children, but Lord willing, when I do have a child that's born, I'm not going to hold it up and say, my Lord, my master. <laughs> just not what I'm going to do. It's just awkward. But that's what David does. David says that. He says, the Lord, the master, the master, said to my Lord. Who is the Lord of the most powerful man in the world? Well, David was a student of the word, and he realized the Messiah that was going to come was going to be far greater than just human. He had to be something more. He had to be divine. He had to come from God the Father. Now, I want to illustrate it this way. If you remember, I don't know if you did this. I know I did. I'm, I'm getting kind of old. Um, but back in the day, we used to always call each other's uh, out by their last name. I don't know if people still do that. Uh, Pastor Tim actually did it to me this morning. I walked in and he said, hey, Silver. Um, that, it's just what, what, I don't know, maybe my generation does. Um, I have a, a buddy in my small group whose last name is Lord, which makes it kind of fun. We joke about it. Oh, I'm going to the Lord's house tonight. <laughs> it got crazy at the Lord's house last night, just... Got a little out of control. Now, even with the last name Lord, I can, almost, I can almost promise you that my buddy Rob doesn't call his son Caleb Lord. It's just weird. We don't do that. And that's what, that's what Jesus is saying. He's something more. He's not just a man. He's divine. And that's where he gets his power. That's where he gets his authority. But why does Jesus say this? this again, this is the first thing he says that's not a question and again, going back, this is what happened. He said, while they were listening to this, he went on to tell them a parable because he was near Jerusalem. The people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. The people wanted a William Wallace. They wanted somebody to walk into Jerusalem with his broadsword and kick out the Romans. And so Jesus again reminds them, this isn't just about the physical, tangible kingdom. It's so much bigger than what you think it is. And so that's the point he's, he's trying to make. Now, you might have noticed that I skipped a little bit, skipped a, se a section. And Why did Jesus say this? Right? So he quotes the whole verse. Why does, he, why does he do that? Why doesn't he just say, David declares in the book of the Psalms, the Lord said to my Lord, David calls him Lord, how then can he be his son? Why does he quote the whole verse? Why does he say, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Let me quote Joel Green here. He says, sit at my right hand refers to the ascription of honor. We're going to talk more about that later. But sitting at someone's right hand was a position of honor. But the present text leaves open-ended how this might take place, right? He just states it and moves on. Similarly, the reference to enemies in this psalmic citation cannot be overlooked in this hostile co-text, even if it is not yet clear how Jesus' enemies, the Jewish leadership, the nobles, attached to the Jerusalem temple will be subdued before Jesus. We, we don't know the rest of the story yet in this passage. Only in Luke's second volume, or the book of Acts, in the Pentecost address of Peter, Peter's preaching, do we learn how Jesus will be honored as Lord? His exaltation to the right hand of God, that place of honor and installation as Lord, come via his resurrection and ascension, which together constitute his divine vindication. All right? He's saying that Jesus Christ, we don't know this yet in the story. He's saying, but there's going to come a time where he's going to be crucified. He's going to die. He's going to be buried. He's going to raise again. He's going to ascend on high, and he's going to be seated at the right hand of God, and his enemies are going to be made a footstool for his feet. We don't see that yet. But Jesus is just saying, yeah, that's, that's me. This is, this is bigger than just coming in here and kicking out, kicking out the Romans. All right, I want to move on now to the authority of the teachers of the law. 
Jesus makes a, a pretty big transition here saying, this is who I am. Now we're going to look at who these people are. And so we're going to read Luke 20, 45 through 21, 4, the rest of the passage. But before I do that, I want to, I have a slide up here. This is from Pastor Tim from a couple weeks ago, describing who these Sadducees were. This is from N.T. Wright, and he says this, By the time Judea became a Roman providence in AD 6, the ruling high priestly family was firmly established but without any solid claim to antiquity. What does that mean? The Levites should have been the ones that were in the temple. They should have been descendants from Levi that were operating in the temple. If you look back, if you've ever tried to read your Bible through and start from the beginning in Genesis, and you read Genesis, Exodus, and then you get to a book called Leviticus or Leviticus, and you just go, what? <laughs> Those guys were the ones that studied the, that book so that they could implement the laws. And, it, and their line and their heritage should have been traced all the way then now to the temple. That's not what's going on anymore. Why? Because these nobles have taken over. Their interest, these individuals, these Sadducees, their interest thus lay in keeping the peace between Rome and, and often discontented people. If this meant pacifying the Romans, they did so. So if King Herod gets upset, guess who loses their job? These guys do. So if a rebel is causing a stink, we got to figure out a way to take him out before this guy takes us out. Because this guy is affecting not just my livelihood, he's affecting my pockets, he's affecting my honor in society. This guy's bad and we got to take him out. That's what's going on here. So that's, let's, let's go ahead and, uh, and look at the first point. We see this self-prescribed image. They make up their own image. This is what Jesus says. This is why all the people were listening. Jesus said to his disciples. All right, so it's, it's kind of one of those scenes where, again, you've got, it'd be a man, just, just a church, a massive group of people here, and I, and I turn to just like my wife and, and a couple other LDI interns, right? And I just say, hey, listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just talk to you guys, but clearly all of you can hear what I'm saying. All right, that's what Jesus is doing. He's talking to the disciples, and he says, beware. Warning. I don't know if you're a fan of the um, TV show, The Office. Um, I used to watch it a lot, and then the last season came on, and it was just, you know, it was disappointing, right? It was Steve Carell was no longer the boss, and uh, they get some new guy. I don't remember who it was, but there's this one scene, though, where the boss is out of the room, and all of the uh, employees of, of, of the company get together, and they start talking about the boss. And I think it's Phyllis who says, we need to come up with some kind of warning system in case the boss comes back. Well, before she can finish her sentence, the boss walks in. And so Kevin, with all of his divine wisdom, he just says, he just goes, warning, warning, warning. <laughs> and then Phyllis tips herself out of her chair to make a distraction, and it works. <laughs> Jesus is doing this. He's not just saying, hey, just want to give you a heads up. Just look out for these guys. No, he's saying, like, warning. Beware of the teachers of the law. And this is the indictment that he makes on them. He says, they like to walk around in flowing robes and love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces. The issue here is not respect. There's nothing wrong with wanting to feel respected or be respected when you go places. The issue is how they get their respect. And we see here from the text he gets his respect by walking around in flowing robes. Now, what does that mean? In this culture, and especially for those religious teachers of the law, the longer the robe, the nicer the quality of the robe, meant they were a better scholar. So literally, based on their outward appearance, people looked at them and said, he must love God. Just based on the outward, experience, outward appearance. That guy's something special. Therefore, we should greet you with honor just based on how we dressed. Jesus says, beware of that. Warning against those guys. And if you are those guys, warning. So I was trying to think of, um, is there anything at Hope that I could connect this with? Do we do anything like this here at Hope? Or at least do the pastors, right? Let's just not throw ourselves under the bus. Let's throw them under the bus. Do the pastors do anything like this? And so I, I realized there's a connection. <laughs> I realize it has everything to do with beard length. 
So, so Tim usually is in first place. I know he it used to have a name. I forget what it was. His beard had a name that, that they called it. Wolfgang? Wolfgang. I don't, know, I don't know if it's back to name status yet, but uh, it might get there. And then, and then Drew, I think he might have recently trimmed it. Oh, by the way, I unashamedly Facebook stock to get these photos. I'd... And you'll be pleased to know that none of the pastors take selfies. None of them do. Um, Drew, though, I think has trimmed it up since then. And Steve is, Steve is an anomaly because one day he'll have a beard. The next day he'll have a goatee thing like that. And the next day he'll have a beard again. I don't... I don't know how he does it. I don't know what he's eating, um, but it's pretty remarkable. And then you've got these two. Um, I'm going to take that picture off because I know we won't stop laughing if I leave that up there. Obviously, I'm, I'm, I'm just kidding, I think. Um, beard length has nothing to do with, with their scholarly image. But Jesus here is saying, beware of these guys. Beware of somebody who, based on their outward appearance, says, I'm... I'm special. God loves me more than you because I have a better relationship with him. Beware of that. The second thing that he says is this self-prescribed honor. And he says this. He says that they love to be greeted. Or sorry, and they love, uh, they have the most important seats in the synagogue and the places of honor at banquets. Now, um, like I said, I was in the LDI, Trek One uh, program that I went through here at Hope. It was fantastic. I did the typical uh, Bible school, preacher, preacher school. And then when I wanted to plant and I came to Hope, uh, they said this would be a great opportunity for you to just further your education, further your ministry experience. And so I was uh, thrilled to be able to do this. And, and one of the classes that we take is with Pastor Tim. And he, and he teaches an Old Testament class. And there, there may be still some availability. If you have the opportunity to take that class, email Pastor Tim, and I'm sure he'd love to talk to you about that. Um, in this class, though, we, we got to read a book called The Social World of Luke Acts. And Tim had divided us up into, um, like, groups, you know, for, like, a little group project. And my group got table manners and banquets. Um, and so I want to examine what does it mean that they like to be seated in the nice seats and the places of honor at banquets. And so uh, this author of this book, he says this, even when likes eat with likes, one would expect in a strongly structured cosmos, such as the first century Jewish world, there'd be some sort of map of persons, even at a meal, some order of who sits where, all right? You, you're following with them? Like, they're the same type of people, right? They're, they're all Republicans, and they all get together, right? There's some order of who sits where, whether that's at a, a wedding and you have the groom and the bride and you've got the best man and the maid of honor and then just everyone else to fill the stage. It just goes on down the line, right? It's a place of honor. So he says this, seating arrangements signal and replicate one's role and status in a group. As regards roles, we speak of the head table at a banquet. We expect there to be a leader of the feast who presides over the meal and seats guests, pours wine, leads the conversation, etc., as regards seating positions and status, the right hand of the host is traditionally the place of honor. So these nobles, these Pharisees, Sadducees, teachers of the law say, look at who I am, respect me, I want to be in a place of honor. Now, this picture illustrates what, uh, what this might look like. Now, they didn't have tables like we eat at tables. They didn't sit at chairs like we sit at chairs. They reclined on the floor. So let's say the guy in the middle there with the red uh, shirt, this took place in in our class, by the way. Um, Mike there is in the red shirt. Let's say he's the head of the table. And then Kean at the bottom, he's then would be at the right hand. He's the guest of honor. And so he actually literally leans and reclines on the host. And they would then eat off the food in the middle. And then Patrick there at the top, he would be a dishonored guest, or or at least the least honored guest in that, right? Um, and, and imagine that there's not just three. Let's say it's the Last Supper. There's, there's 13 people around a table. So it's a, it's a longer circle. And so if you can imagine, if everyone wants to sit by Jesus, the people all the way at the other end aren't really having a conversation here, right? And you got to remember that the food, let's say they, they butchered a goat for a feast. Guess who's getting the, the tenderloin, right? It, it's the head of the table and the honored guest. The guy all at the end, right? I, who knows what he's getting? He's getting the stomach and the sinew or liver or something. <clears throat> these individuals are saying, I need to be honored. 
honor who I am because God loves me more than you, therefore I get to sit here. I get to sit in the better seat when I come to church. This is my spot. It's got my name on it, right? Because I'm something. I work at the church. The pastor knows me. Yeah, we just had dinner last night. I went over to his house. I'm, I'm, I'm something. Beware of that. Warning, warning, warning. We see this God-prescribed judgment. He says this. These individuals, they devour widows' houses. These widows would have been the expendables. Kors talked about this. Pastor Kors talked about this before. These were people who just, in society, were so looked down upon that, that people just didn't even care, including the religious leaders. That I will take, take, take from these people because they're worthless in God's sight. I am something special. Jesus says they devour widows' houses and for a show make lengthy prayers. Nothing wrong with lengthy prayers. The problem is when we do it for a show. To say, hey, look who I am. I'm something. God loves me more. I can earn God's love. These men will be punished most severely. We've seen Jesus talk about punishment in parable form. He does this in Luke 19.27 as well as in Luke 20.16. But this is not a parable. He's saying that these individuals who take advantage of the poor, who look at these expendables as nothing, who say, I'm something based on my outward appearance, honor me, they will be punished. Warning. Don't be like that. Again, Joel Green says this, Jesus' pronouncement of judgment on such a person is subtly ironic. Seeking abundance in the public arena of status and honor, they will instead receive abundance in the arena of divine condemnation. Insofar as Jesus and the Jerusalem leadership have been ensconced in a struggle over who has authority to interpret Scripture faithfully and to lead the people, this indictment on them is devastating. Finally, I want to look at the authority of the teachers of law and this manipulation of a religious system. Now, I'm not an English major. Um, I never was good at English, so... I'm not sure if I worded this the right way, the manipulation of a religious system. I think you can read that, either the manipulation, the the system's being manipulated or the system's doing the manipulation. That's what I want you to think, the system's doing the manipulation. I don't know if I said that right, but uh, that's where we're going. It's this manipulation of a religious system. And again, here Jesus just takes a giant cup of irony. He just gets done saying, beware of these people, beware of the teachers of the law, And as he looks up, he saw the rich. That would have included these Sadducees. That would have included these teachers of the law putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. This is what one commentary says. These little copper scale-like coins were equivalent in value to a farthing. Clearly this author is from uh, England as well. And he says that this a farthing is, is equivalent to a quarter of a penny. At least it was. I don't think they use this type of money denomination anymore. But it's, it's, it's literally the two smallest coins you could possibly have. That's what she's giving. Now read this. According to the Jewish laws at that time, it was not permissible to cast in less than two gifts. That is the manipulation of the poor. Imagine if Pastor Tim, when he was up here talking about the offering... Imagine if he goes, can I go back? Yeah. Imagine if he, he opened up this verse and he said, and he saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. Listen, Hope Community Church, God loves you, but you know how you can earn his love even more? We would ask that you give at least a $2 minimum when this plate comes by. To plant a seed and blessing will be poured out on top of you. That's manipulation. It's a a system that says, in order to be pleasing to God, you need to give to the church, therefore give to me. You need to, even as a poor widow, fill my pockets. Then he says this, truly I tell you, he said, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. When I first was given this text to preach, I honestly thought, Oh boy, you're telling me the first passage you want me to get up in front of Hope Community Church to preach on is going to be about giving to the church? (laughs) Thanks. (laughs) 
But as I dug into it, I realized that's not what this passage is about at all. Not even close. Because I could stand up here, and I could manipulate it, and I could say, God doesn't care how much you give. He cares about how you give. You might have heard something like that before, which is true. God loves a cheerful giver. This is not what this text is proving. Let me read one one last quote here by Joel Green. He says, In this case, just as Jesus indicts the religious leadership for consuming the homes of widows, so now he laments the travesty of a religious system that has its effect the devouring of this widow's livelihood. Note that in no way does Luke suggest that Jesus finds this widow's actions exemplary or praiseworthy. How could he? When the religious system was supposed to care for such as these, not render them utterly destitute. Jesus' mission is to bring good news to the poor, including this widow, not to impoverish the poor even further. And what's crazy is next week, Steve's going to get up here and he's going to preach and he's going to start off with this passage where the people listening say, man, isn't this temple beautiful? Are you kidding me? How How do you think it got this way? From abusing the poor. So the question I have for you is, in closing, who's the authority in your life? Is it King Jesus? Is it the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Messiah, who came to die on this cross for your sins and my sins? That's step one. It's not a matter of saying, I'm going to go to church. I'm going to give a lot of money to the church. I'm going to look a certain way. I'm going to dress a certain way. I'm going to talk a certain way. Therefore, maybe in some way, earn God's merit, love, favor. Can't do that. It's already been done. Have you bowed your knee to King Jesus? If you haven't, today's the day. Today's the day. On the other side of that, you might be thinking, man, I'm really glad I'm not like the dudes that were described by Jesus in this passage. And so I want to give a a warning to all of us in here who might be sitting there thinking that we're better than the guy who dresses up. That we're somehow better because I give out of my poverty where that guy gives out of his wealth. It's a warning. That we need to bow our knees to King Jesus, say you are the Messiah, that there's nothing that I can do to merit your love, or your salvation. It's only through what you've done. So God, help me to not judge people. Gosh, right now in our society, to not judge people based on their outward appearance, but to love and to cherish and to give to the poor. Pastor Drew, Pastor Drew mentioned an opportunity for this. this is, again, this is not like, this is not going to earn you any favor with God, but downstairs is a bunch of little M&M things you can fill with quarters. So, man, I don't, I don't have a lot of money, but I can give a couple quarters to help the poor. That, that's, that's the church taking action. Would you pray with me as we look at, as we bow our head to God the Father, who's given us his Son. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for who you are, that you are our Heavenly Father. You are Abba Father. You are so good. You are so gracious. That I pray that you would help all of us in here who think, even those of us who are fully devoted followers of you, those of us who would say, yes, I'm, I am a child of the king. I have been redeemed. That you would help us to not look down on somebody else based on their outward appearance or to ascribe honor to them based on their outward appearance. That we would take heed to the warning that your son gave us. That we would love you. That we would cherish you. That we would thank you. That we would Go from here, and we even now lift up our voices in honor and worship to the King. It's Christ's name that we pray. Amen.